So we have Muscovy um, Minogons, the Red Oyster Dogwood, the Red Oyster Dogwood uh, Cornus Saracia is um, super common uh, sh flowering shrub. Uh, it's a little shrubby bush. People will call it red gad. Uh, I don't know why, but a lot of people know it as that. Uh, but it's like, yeah, in the winter you see all those real bright uh, sticks. Especially if there's like a little bit of snow. You usually see it like encroaching on different fields. You'll see uh, like this red barrier. Or if you're driving by a swamp, you'll see bright red shoots all throughout. And, um, and that's probably the dogwood. We have all different sorts of dogwoods here too. We have red oyster dogwood. Uh, we have gray alternate dogwood, silky, all different sorts of dogwood, uh, and they're all sort of used the same way. Uh, but the red oyster dogwood is by far the most extensively used one. And so, so yeah, I really want to focus on pain and like pain management here first. So with the scovium logos. Um, uh, we use the bark, so you just scrape all the bark off and let it dry, and uh, and you could you could grind it up if you want, uh, or you could just leave it whole, make your tea. One of the most important things, though, when you're using scovium logos as a pain management medicine, you really need to have the pith. Uh, there's a heartwood, uh, the in the inner. Part of the tree there's like this spongy styrofoamy pith uh, and and that needs to be scraped out so what you'll have is like a bunch of bark with uh, that that usually as it dries it oxidizes so it turns like this brownish color so you have brownish bark with bits of bright red uh, and then you'll have these bright white styrofoamy pieces um, there was this amazing um, uh, research done up north I think it was in northern Alberta with a, with Creek communities that still have really strong traditional midwifery uh, practices in their community and uh, this is one of the things that they experience in one of the local hospitals where um, the the uh, the women use still use this medicine uh, during childbirth to help with pain and uh, and it's just a tea they drink the tea while they're in labor and uh, and and they prefer this over an epidural so women who have had multiple children who've tried an epidural they'll uh, they'll they'll completely resist the, the epidural and make sure they have their medicine for their next children. They have to have that medicine. And yeah, that prefer preference over epidurals is a really amazing idea to understand. Um, uh, so what they're saying is that it's better than an epidural <laughs> to manage pain in uh, during childbirth. Uh, and what they use for that tea, for that medicine, is only exclusively the pith the the inner part of the tree that styrofoamy heartwood uh, center that's all they use they grind that up into powder and mommy slams that uh, while she's uh, going into uh, or during during labor so they have some really really amazing stories and it's not very well studied to figure out exactly you know what the mechanism of action is but we can uh, understand that you know it's very effective, and 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 uh, they, yeah, they prefer it over an epidural. So it's pretty cool to understand that. So I mean, like the red oyster dogwood is it was really amazing for for all different sorts of pain, uh, not just during labor. I guess one of the one of the main ones is uh, um, for uh, um, when women will have uterine cramps. And experience that that type of pain, you know, shedding the endometrial lining every month. Uh, generally, there's spasming there. Uh, the one of the things to understand about that spasming is that the spasm is a backup plan. It's not what the uterus is supposed to be doing. The uterus is supposed to be a big, strong, complex. Uh, onion muscle <laughs> and uh, and it's supposed to be able to muscle off the lining every month uh, what happens though 
is that uh, this muscle is gets weak, uh, and sometimes we're even, the women are even born with a with with one that's. Uh, uh, it, it not toned. It's not. It's not strong. And then, and so, when the uterus is not strong, the spasming is a backup plan to rip the lining off. Uh, and sometimes that ripping will result in a tear. Uh, and that tear will turn into scar tissue, and the scar tissue can turn into a fibroid. And a lot of women issues uh, are coming from uh, weak. Uh, uterus muscle <laughs> and so one of the most amazing things about red oyster dogwood is that it helps with pain directly but also peripherally too so for menstrual pain it tones the muscle what it does is it gives the uterus like a workout and so it's like lifting weights all month and uh uh, and every time you use this tea and so as it gets stronger it's able to get the lining off uh, on its own without spasming and so the way that it helps with pain is not to stop the spasm or to numb the pain or whatever but it it fixes the problem it makes the uterus strong uh, so it's really amazing the way that red oyster dogwood has this really super amazing role in dealing with pain directly like the way these women use it for epidurals, but then uh, the the way that it helps with pain peripherally by giving your body the ability to have uh, um, uh, uh, to to not put it to not make itself vulnerable to that type of to whatever type of pain. But what I wanted to talk to you guys most about regarding red oyster dogwood, it has to do sort of with this this interpretive technique where, you know, these medicines are all showing us how they're all talking to us, teaching us how they can be used, uh, purposes and gifts that they have. Uh, and with the red oyster dogwood, one of the things that we need to do is just take a second and look at this tree, look at this shrub and try to identify what makes it special, what makes Squavim the most unique, different than all of the other trees, and uh, so we could see that it's red. We could see uh, that it's it has this really striking color, and that's unique. And so you know maybe it has something to do with blood, uh, um, which it kind of does. We could cover that later. But the the main thing that I wanted us to understand is that it's really flexible. And so when red oyster dogwood is super flexible, like even in the winter, it creates this component in the fall that allows the tree so that when it's freezed, it could be exposed to beyond minus 80 degrees Celsius and it won't crystallize, it won't become damaged, it won't freeze uh, until it's exposed to these. So like I, I even one time I went to, uh, I was with Great Lakes cultural camps with Mayangan and Small Cook. We were in Ktegansi uh, in... Uh, Quebec, I forget what that town was, but I had a whole bunch of kids. We went snowshoeing. It was like minus 25. You could hear all the trees knocking at night because of how cold it was. And when we went out, I I took the I told them to uh, one one guy he hugged the cedar tree, and all the leaves just fell right off because everything like when it's cold everything is so brittle. All my nails I break all my nails and get super mad. Uh, the skitty hugged the cedar. All the leaves fell off, and every twig that they touched just snapped. And then I got him. I told him. To, uh, I took my knife and I scraped it against the bark of red oyster dogwood, and like a, and it was like I was, it was like I was spritzing a lime. A whole bunch of uh, fluid was building up on my knife and 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 splashing out into the sunlight, and so you could see it like Windex spray. Uh, and then the kids were like, not as dramatic as Windex spray. Maybe when the bottle starts to break, uh, uh, just a little bit of water coming out. But they noticed like, hey, this is not frozen. How is this not frozen? And so what I did with the tamarack, I mean with the squavim, um, also the red oyster dogwood, is we were like able to make pretzels with it. Uh, it was still super flexible. And so I was showing them that, you know, this tree, this is what makes it special. This is what makes it unique. And if ever you want to listen to somebody, uh, it, it is through the their uniqueness that they are effectively communicating to you. 
Uh, and so, yeah, same thing with plants. And so let's take a second look at this extremely flexible tree. It's made to even be flexible even in the middle of winter. So this is something very special. So let's look at that and, uh, and try to listen to it. And then they're able to understand right away, like, how can this tree be used? And so they say, well, this is why we use it for dream catchers, for baskets, to make wicker baskets and chairs. And, uh, you know, anytime you need something flexible, so immediately able to understand utilitarian purpose, uh, but uh, also how important it is for uh um like when we're looking at diseases and understanding what kind of problems you could use it for eh, immediately everyone always says arthritis it doesn't really matter how old you are everyone kind of understands what arthritis is arthritis is the number one disease that affects first nations people by a landslide so we're all quite familiar and we're all expecting this at a certain point in our life uh, two different degrees, varying degrees. The farther north you go, the worse that it gets. <laughs> They're just wrecked up there. But um, this red oyster dogwood is nice and flexible. So when we start to develop arthritis and get really stiff and sore, it is this um, squalbeam logos that we need to be using to help make us nice and flexible again. So a real easy way to remember that. Uh, but absolutely one of the most amazing things that it does. Uh, um, uh, so I wanted to sort of talk about, I guess, three things. But the Squabim Nagos, the Red Icer Dogwood, Zisagopamish, uh, Zisagopamish, Gopamish is uh, Willow. So we'll have like... Pussy Willow and Bebs Willow. I'll put here Salix Candida, uh, which is Pussy Willow. Uh, um, same thing. Willow and Red Oyster Dogwood are really, really incredible medicines to help with uh, flexibility and help with arthritis when you're getting stiff and sore to give you everything you need to be able to become fl nice and flexible again. So super, super important. Uh, they share that same interpretation in the middle of winter. They're still extremely flexible. Uh, so this is how they are to be used. This is where they shine, where they're the most effective. Now, the Zisogopamish um, and Skovim Nagos have a really amazing, one of the reasons why I like them so much is because we can be sensitive to uh, salicids like aspirin. So uh, it's just like, I guess this natural allergy salicids are really uh, uh, complex. Your body doesn't really like them. Uh, just like nightshades, everybody's uh, talking about nightshades and tomatoes and all, eggplants and uh, don't eat nightshades. They cause inflammation and lectins and all of these different things, you know. Uh, you can get as Stephen Grundry as you want. But... Um, uh, some people are sensitive to salicids. That's the point. Willow has salicids. Red oyster dogwood does not. So if, when people are allergic to willow, uh, it's like naturally there's the alternative, the dogwood. Um, and uh, and I've actually had people sensitive to salicids from kids to elders who, you know, can't really engage in the willow, so they have to use red oyster dogwood. So mainly, I like to say the most accessible for everybody. It's probably going to be the Red Oyster Dog with the Squabim Nagos. Um, and I want to explain to you guys exactly what's happening here. It's actually super, super cool. When you have... Uh, uh, so now we're going to sort of talk about the development of arthritis. How does it work? This is something that we just figured out like in 2013 or 2014. Uh, super, super recently. I think it was Princeton, Princeton University. It was the first university to be able to identify what actually happens with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so if you get cut, if your finger gets cut, your skin is broken, uh, the first part of your immune system is compromised. Now a bunch of bad guys can come in, viruses, bacteria, proteins, fungus, whatever can come into your body. So that cut your immune system is activated and it gets sent there. Uh, two parts to your immune system. One is called macrophages. And macrophages go to that cut and they're just these big boober, boogery, blubbery balls that just roll around everywhere and eat all of the bad guys coming in. Um, 
The second cell that's sent there is called a neutrophilic cell. There's, it's a white blood cell uh, that it, it just it has like guns and it goes to that cut and it just sprays acid everywhere, killing, essentially killing, singeing everything that's coming in. Uh, neutrophils, actually, you know what I'm talking about. You could see, you could see them. Uh, like if you blow your nose and it's green, uh, those are neutrophils that are alive. Uh, they, they're, they're spraying acid, trying to kill an infection. They're super destructive. They're actually so destructive that your body will make sure that they die every five to 20 minutes. Uh, they and and so when they die they turn yellow so like if you blow your nose and it's yellow those are neutrophils that have died so you can actually see this part of your immune system every time you get sick or every time you have a little infection uh, so it's pretty neat to understand that uh, the, the but yeah there's just such a destructive cell uh, that yeah they they're programmed to die every every couple of minutes they're not meant to last long uh, and so arthritis happens when your cut is healed and you have a scab and then the scab turns into a scar that barrier is reformed and so what happens is there's no risk for bad guys to come into that cut anymore viruses bacteria proteins fungus whatever so your immune system is supposed to say okay no more cut there uh, we don't need neutrophils there anymore we don't need these macrophages there anymore and that response is supposed to be retracted but what happens when we're these big balls of insulin all day long that don't sleep and watch too much young and the restless is uh your immune system is confused and what happens is it will still send neutrophils there like as if there's a cut and the neutrophils spraying acid everywhere and what happens is that acid starts to eat away at your bones so now your bones are starting to become weak your your joints are starting to become attacked and losing tissue and what happens when you start to lose that tissue is your your body can see you know these bones are becoming very brittle we need more bones we need to regrow this joint and so a bunch of growth hormones are sent to that bone and to to regrow all of the tissue that's being eaten by this acid uh, and it's growing bone in the presence of all of that acid and so it's generally a little bit deformed but what the most important thing to understand is that as that hole is being filled with new healthy bone uh, um, it's like I always use this example because everybody kind of understands in Sudbury they don't fix the holes in the road <laughs> You just have massive puddles all over the place. No one fills it up. Uh, lucky for us, though, you know, our immune system will fill up all of those puddles, uh, unlike Sudbury. Uh, what happens, though, when we're just big balls of insulin all day long, having too much sugar, exposed to too much stress, and, and way too much insulin, those growth hormones don't leave. And this is why we talk so much about diseases of excess growth being such a huge issue driven uh, by insulin, uh, like cancer and cardiovascular disease, arthritis. Uh, these are all diseases of growth, all diseases of insulin, hyperinsulinemic conditions. And so when there's too much insulin, the growth hormones just stay there. They grow all of the bone, fix the pothole, but then they just keep growing, keep putting a giant pile of asphalt there, a big giant pile of bone that doesn't have to be there. And, and it's all that extra bone that will eventually fuse the joint shut so that it's not able to move anymore. And this confusion of your immune system and of your growth hormones and your connective tissue and your bones and joints and ligaments and stuff is gonna spread to all of the other fingers until you have a finger that's fused until you have a hand that's fused and totally stuck so you can't move it and, and so you're like Sanford and then and, and then it'll spread to your wrists and your wrists will get fused <laughs> and then your elbows will get fused and and all that extra bone will fuse it shut uh, and then it'll spread into your shoulders and then into your spine 
and so until like every part of uh, uh, this is affected by the arthritis and you're completely dependent on somebody for feeding and for bathroom and for cleaning and uh, it's a really devastating disease. It's an autoimmune disease. It's driven by cellular senescence and inflammation. Uh, and um, uh, But the, the driving force of the disease are those neutrophilic cells. The problem, the damage that's done is all that extra bone. So the most beautiful, most amazing thing that we need to remember is that Scobie Lagons, the Sogopamish, Red Eyes or Dogwood, uh, Willow, um, they have their chemistry, their medicines inside of them uh, do two things. They inhibit that influx of neutrophilic cells. So they, so all these cells spraying acid everywhere. It's like Willow comes in and gives your immune system a little slap like, pew, pew, what the heck? You haven't had a cut here in 40 years. What the heck are you still sending neutrophils there? These are destroying everything. So then that response is retracted. So the driving force of the disease is removed. Now you're left with all this damage. And so the components inside of Scobium Nogons, the Sogopamish, what they do is they, uh, they mediate growth factors in the connective tissue. What that means is that gives your body the ability to see that Hey, there's only supposed to be bone right here. Why is there a whole bunch of extra bone? What is all of this? We don't need that. And, and so Willow comes in again. Red oyster dogwood comes in again. Gives your immune system a little slap. Pew, pew. Get, you don't need that extra bone. What the heck are you doing growing all that? And so it becomes hormonally rejected. When all that extra bone is hormonally rejected, your body begins to, uh, your immune system will see it. And it'll see all of that extra bone that's fusing your joint shut. This is a threat. Your immune system will see, hey, we got to get rid of that. This is not supposed to be here. And so uh, your immune system will go there again, but this time in a perfectly controlled way and start to reabsorb all of the calcium from that extra bone. And as that extra bone is getting reabsorbed, your range of motion will come back. So when you look at Reducer Dogwood and, and Zizogopamish uh, and their flexibility, their, their gift that they show you, you look at those trees and, and, and you say, I want you to help me with that. Help me be nice and flexible. I'm stuck. Then uh, as that bone is becoming reabsorbed, your range of motion comes back until it's completely gone. And so when we make this medicine with Skobim Nagon, Zizogopamish, uh, take all these different medicines and we cook them inside of a and make a salve and ointment uh, um, one of the projects that we did we worked with a community in the far north uh, just like riddled with arthritis where you know they can they can they got us uh, 30 people in the community who are fused into the spine no range of motion in, in any of their uh, uh, fingers, wrists, elbows, shoulders, completely dependent on care, um, uh, usually by ki their kids. Uh, their kids can cannot maintain a job while uh, taking care of a fully dependent uh, parent. So they lose their job, sometimes even their kids. Uh, and so it's a really bad situation. And so I said, okay. So I worked with this community uh, and all of the, 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 the satellite communities around them and, and said, you know, uh, I'll just, I'll give you a whole bunch of this medicine. I just gave it to them for, for, like, for like next to nothing, like for free. And the only thing that I wanted to know is uh, uh, how fast what's the what's the timeline how fast does it can it take for these medicines to work and uh, out of any everybody there was 27 of their participants who adhered to the protocol it took them eight months from when they were completely fused with rheumatoid arthritis to when they had a specialist appointment who was able to say that there is no sign that you've ever had this disease before 
some had elevated calcium levels just because of the reabsorption that was happening. But the uh, um, they were they were all able to move again, learning how to learning how to write. You know, they haven't been able to hold a pen in thirty years, and so now they could write again. Uh, they could. Uh, uh, send postcards and they were, sign their name again uh, and, and so they all had these like really tremendous stories of 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 uh, of, of this and and so that was just you know one time but like the arthritis medicine uh, the red oyster dogwood and Z scopamish these are like my absolute favorite medicines to give to anybody and everybody because it has one of the most striking results on arthritis there's like those really chronic benefits you know the the healing from the driving force of the disease uh, um, and and um, getting rid of all of that extra tissue like really healing the chronic effects of the arthritis but uh, there's some really immediate effects too. So what happens when we start to drink these as tea, uh, again, like willows, if people are sensitive to salicylates, salicylates like aspirin, uh, then uh, then the willow should not be uh, uh, one that, uh, that like I, I wouldn't support. But certainly the red oyster dogwood and those salicylate-free um, uh, medica- medicines inside, like, uh, um, when you make this tea the next day like sometimes my favorite stories is just like just you know when people wake up in the morning and you're super sore you kind of like lie in bed a little bit and you you just sort of do a little bit of exercises roll around um working with your fingers a little bit you know just just gotta work that little bit of soreness out uh before you want to get out of the bed and walk around and make some coffee and uh have shower or something like that so it's it's um those people who just yeah just have this level of pain every day that you just manage you just deal with it sometimes you deal with it with pharmaceutical uh interventions different different pain medication uh but um what happens when you when these people have it's called even the most uh the bark tea they wake up in the morning and it's like that all of their joints are just full of butter and you just get out of bed and uh, your body just moves. It feels fantastic and uh, and the level of pain is so low. What usually happens though, one of my favorite things um, uh, is, is using it in aging, you know, especially women who, who are going through, you know, their aging process. Women are just these creatures designed to deal with so much pain <laughs> and you just deal with it uh like uh, like i'm i'm a really firm believer that you know if ever, if any woman could just you know lend to their husband an hour uh uh, the pain that they deal with on a regular basis, we'll, we would just fold. <laughs> uh, um, women are, yeah, absolutely incredible. And I think that um, uh, um, this is why, you know, as we age, our pain tolerance uh, goes, goes, just slowly gets higher and higher and higher. So when we're old, and old women especially, would just deal with the most outrageous amounts of pain every day uh, and one of the one of the consequences of that is sleep so as we age we get older a lot of older women uh, sleep less maybe four three four or five hours a night uh, and what actually is responsible for not allowing you to sleep and you know forcing you to have to nap all the time to catch up on on these sleeps it's the pain that wakes you up in the morning it's the pain that doesn't allow you to achieve those last two three sleep cycles a night and uh uh, and force you to have this napping lifestyle uh it's pain that is responsible for waking up now if you're able to manage your own pain um uh, and use scolabim the losolabol. They have this medicine tea from red oyster dogwood. Everybody has the same story, and it's super cute. It's real funny. I went to Mikuk, the senior center in Wiki in Mikomkom, my community, and uh, it was just like I would make tea while they quilted. Like on Thursdays, they would quilt, and I would come in and make tea, and we'd have tea. 
uh, they would quilt. Uh, I'd be there for a couple hours, and they'd go and drive me home. And and, and it was like a, I'd get a couple, you know, hundred bucks here and there. And it was super fun, like when we were first starting. Uh, it was one of my favorite groups to work with. But I went there once, and uh, I made the Scobin the Los Doritos or dog with tea, and I had the pith in there and everything, and uh, that that really good pain medicine. And I made them the tea, and uh, I said, they said, "What'd you make today?" And I said, "Scobin the Los it's good for pain." And then they got mad at me a little bit. I got I got a little bit of a lecture, um, and uh, the idea here was that. You know, don't tell me that something is going to help with pain. Uh, and there was some trauma behind that. So one of the women spoke up and said, you know what? Every time somebody says something that is going to help with pain, it never goes well. <laughs> it never goes well because you know what? I start taking this medication uh, that helps with pain and uh, I don't, doesn't really help me to feel good. And you know what actually ends up happening is, other people know that I have this medication and they want it, you know, talking about opiates, I guess. And uh, what happens then is uh, I'll get hurt. They hurt me to get that medicine, those drugs, uh, to get this pain medication. And I can't, I, I don't like that. Don't tell me that the medicine is good for pain. Every time I hear that, I get hurt. Or somebody gets hurt. And so there was like this really broken idea with uh, the group that we were working with. And I was like, I was just a kid. And I don't know, I was like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, to say this. I didn't mean to really, you know, hurt your feelings. And I thought, oh, geez, okay, well, you know, the tea is delicious. So let's just enjoy this tea because it tastes really good. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, uh, and so like I try to shrug it off and, um, that, but yeah, just thinking about this issue of, uh, elder abuse and prescription medication. And I was like, man, this is a real problem. And so, uh, um, uh, so yeah, you know, they just kept quilting. Once the tea was done warming up, I brought them all cups and, uh, and they started drinking and, uh, they quilt in the center of this big room. They have all those quilt quilting, I don't know what you call them, horses, I guess. And uh, there's a bunch of couches all around us. And, um, you know, a couple of them are quilting. And then you see them just like they're getting a little bit lazy, resting their face, quilting. And then one of them was like, whew, I'm going to lie down. She sat on the couch and then just snoring <laughs> right away. And we're all looking at her like, holy, she must have had a bad sleep. And then um, they just started not get, nodding off one by one, going to the couch. And then, uh, like, it was a short time after drinking this tea, everyone was sleeping. And I was like, I was like, huh, I, well, I'm not teaching anybody anymore. So uh, I went to Kim, the, the, the coordinator there, and I said, hey, they all passed out. So then she she said, uh, well, I guess we'll take you home now. <laughs> and I went home and uh, yeah, a couple weeks later, went back to do make some tea for them again. And they're all like, I want that medicine again. <laughs> make that pain medicine. Something worked. And they were actually the ones who explained to me they, they deal with so much pain. It wakes them up throughout the night. They have bad sleeps. And then they said, you know, when that pain was gone, the first thing that I wanted to do was sleep. So all of them just passed right out. And uh, then I, I got out of work early. Uh, but but they, they said, yeah, you know, there was something really special special about that tea the the how good i felt how normal i felt you know that pain that you normalize and just deal with every single day this should not be there you do not have to deal with that uh and the squabim the loss is really really good really really important medicine to yeah give you the ability to deal with that 
uh, and and especially that arthritis pain, uh, but then also understanding its role in like emergency or injury type of pain, like the way the women used it for an epidural, uh, or you still use it as an epidural. But the but then also some of the peripheral ways that it helps with pain. So like with menstrual pain, not really, uh, um, uh, uh, not really uh, numbing or dealing with any pain and specifically pain receptors in the uterus, but strengthening it, toning it so that it does not have to resort to spasming. So uh, all different ways this medicine helps with pain and uh, um, uh, r- really easy to brew incorrectly though <laughs> if you use too much oh you can't swallow it it's just off the most awful thing that touches your lips uh, uh, so you know learning how to make it is a little bit of a learning curve you got to practice uh, um, and so we end up using about 10 maybe 15 grams of the bark per gallon of water or so and uh, uh, and that's usually like perfect and it ends up being yeah pretty good uh, this kind of medicine this this uh, bark tea we use it for um, uh, growing pains uh, you could soak a cloth and uh, and people will use that for teething babies uh, when teeth are coming in you soak a cloth and then you could freeze it and give them that cold cloth and all that red oyster dogwood juice is going to be in their mouth and really help with all of that pain. Uh, so it's really good for that too. Uh, but um, one of the things that we do notice, like just peripheral uh, from everything, uh, uh, is uh, when women take it, they f- you could feel the uterus. So... Uh, you could feel it like working out just like when you're pregnant you get to like third trimester you get Braxton Hicks or these false contractions you could feel that Uh, that's like what it feels like but without the pregnancy (laughs) and so you feel like this little bits of exercise happening and that's the uterus like yeah basically just pumping iron getting stronger and um uh, obviously, if this is used during pregnancy, like uh, it's not good. It's n- you'd never do anything during pregnancy. Uh, the the baby would would be injured because of those contractions. Uh, so we don't we don't do that. Uh, it, uh, uh, but yeah, just women outside of pregnancy when they when you use it, uh, there's uh, uh, you feel it. And men, when men use this medicine, there's always this sort of like back, something in the back, like where the kidneys are, just something wrong there. (laughs) And it's not pain, like I said, it helps with pain, but you feel something happening in in the kidneys. Uh, And and, uh, other than that, there's just like a little bit of weirdness inside of the body. But I, I think that those are just peripheral ways that this medicine is dealing with uh, pain management and arthritis, giving your body everything that it needs to be nice and flexible again. Um, so, probably like just uh, my favorite pain management medication, especially for arthritis. Uh, and it just even icing on the cake is the fact that arthritis is the number one disease in First Nations communities in Canada. So that's just like a really important thing that, that I'm really, really happy to share with you guys uh, and, and give you the opportunity to, to, you know, have these experiences for yourself. Uh, so, yeah, I'm so beautiful. Oh, man, I love this so much. <laughs>